Welcome to the Insights Podcast by the UNSW Law Society. The production team would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is made, and pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Um, in today's episode, we'll be chatting with Dr. Rosemary Howell and Nikki Nodrumian on the topic of alternative dispute resolution. Um, Dr. Rosemary currently teaches uh, alternative dispute resolution at an undergraduate level and principled interest-based negotiation at a postgraduate level here at UNSW. Uh, she's a nationally accredited mediator and has appeared in the international who's who of mediation since 2013 and was a 2021 winner of the Academic of the Year by the Australian Law Awards. And um, her company, uh, Strategic Action, also provides consulting services on planning, facilitation, and training to state and federal entities around the globe. Nikki is the UNSW Law Society's Skills Vice President. Her portfolio facilitates competitions that provide students with the opportunity to develop and refine legal skills in a practical setting outside of a classroom. To achieve this, the Skills Portfolio runs internal and external competitions in four key areas, negotiations, client interviewing, witness examination, and mediation. Um, thank you both for joining us today. So I'm, I guess we'll get started with a question for you, Rosemary. Um, but before getting to where you are now, what were your experiences like in university? I found my years at university to be very difficult because in those days I was one of a cohort of 12 in a faculty of 120. And we were kind of invisible and we were not expected to make anything of ourselves. And in fact, if I'm permitted to give you the long answer. Oh, that's all right. Uh, one day in second year law, my property lecturer came up to me and said, uh, Rosemary, you're a very nice girl, which is why I'm talking to you, but you're taking a man's place. Mm. And really, you should think very carefully about that because that's very selfish. And I lay awake that night worrying because I was very young and had a very short life. The next day in my contract class, the guy who used to sit in front of me was missing. He dropped out to become a taxi driver. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm not taking a man's place. He's taking a man's place. So it kind of buoyed me to be more determined. But it was a very discouraging place. It's, of course, it's very different now. Definitely. But, yeah. but it was a hard slog. Hmm. Wow, I feel like, because I'm in second year now, and I guess to see the change from the environment you are studying in, I guess that's very reassuring to see. And I guess, kind of following from that, given your experiences in uni, would you ever imagine that you'd be in the position that you're in now? No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's kind <laughs> no. of a redundant question to ask. No. Um, but you will end up in a place that you couldn't possibly imagine either. Yeah. Mm. I, I think all the things we end up doing didn't exist, yes. yeah. mostly when we started. Yeah. And I guess before we go any deeper, maybe could you explain to the audience kind of what alternative dispute resolution is or kind of what you do? Hmm, easy questions first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what shall I say? Um, well, first of all, alternative dispute resolution probably is a title that's going to vanish in my lifetime. I hope, Nikki, or at least in your lifetime it will vanish because really it refers to non-adjudicative processes that are used to resolve disputes. And the idea of it being alternative really has come under enormous challenge because... um, there's a lot of research now that says it's really mainstream. Yeah. So we should simply talk about it as the non-adjudicative arm of dispute resolution. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. And I guess going off that, um, engaging in that, what does a day look like in your line of work? <laughs> well, I'm a pracademic, yeah. which means that I have life as an academic and life outside an academic. Yeah. So, And I have the lowest threshold of boredom on the planet. No kidding? No, the attention span of a gnat. (laughs) Nikki's in my class this year, she'll tell you I'm a nightmare. Not at all. So my life is an endless variety. I have what you call a portfolio career, which means that there are about five different things that I do. 
and I never really know what's going to come up. Yeah. And so um, every day is different, and I love that. Oh, sounds good. Sounds excellent, yeah. And I guess um, mentioning and kind of going off your experience in uni, um, where did you kind of get um, your first taste of mediation and ADR then, if it um, wasn't in a university environment? It wasn't in the university environment. I certainly, it was not thought of. I, I mean, we've been mediating forever, but we didn't call it that. And we didn't have training and we didn't have research around it. So in the late 80s, the man of my dreams was went to Harvard and did a negotiation course. And he was determined that we'd go back and wanted me to do it too. And I had teenage children, my mother-in-law lived with me and I was working full time and I thought, I really don't want to do this. And he yeah. pushed me and pushed me and I went and it changed my life. And then I did five training programs at Harvard and we were invited back to teach with the faculty in the program. And then Alan negotiated to bring the faculty to Australia. We talked with them around Australia. We made friends and um, it took off from there. Aren't we lucky? Yes. Aren't we lucky, Nikki? Yes. So uh, it's my understanding that you worked with Fisher, Roger Fisher and William Urey I worked in with, Harvard? I worked with Roger Fisher and I also worked with my personal hero, Frank Sander, wow. who's really the father of modern mediation. And he was, the, he was a keynote speaker at the Pound Conference in the late 70s and had a really profound influence on how the modern face of mediations developed. Kidding. And I guess to follow up with that, a question for both of you, and you mentioned that you were kind of surrounded by the trailblazers of mediation, I guess. And But was there anything specific that drew you both to this area of law? I loved the collaboration. Mm. I feel like it's very rare in law to have that opportunity to collaborate and go beyond the scope of legal arguments. Yeah. And I found that when I did my very first negotiation competition, I just loved the opportunities you were able to bring to the table and the value you were able to provide. I just found it really rewarding, but also really challenging because it involves relationships. Yeah. And when relationships, well, relationships are a subcontext to every discussion, yeah, whether definitely. it's legal or non-legal, but in a negotiation, it's a lot about trying to repair a relationship. So. Yeah what I found and I think what I would add is uh, that the answer is always in the interests mm. by which I mean whether we're negotiating a deal or resolving a dispute a good outcome really is informed by what's important to us the law might be a tool to achieve it yeah. but the law doesn't fix it that is true yeah. And we get, the, we get the chance to work with what people really want to, uh, as an outcome and we get the chance to be creative and we get the chance to work in a party-centric environment. Yeah. And most legal practice is actually not party-centric. Mm. So it's infinitely satisfying and we're actually really good at it. <laughs> so how blessed are we to do something that we're good at. Definitely, yeah. And um, would you say the kind of focus on relationships or the two parties is what differentiates ADR from other areas of law? That's a lovely question. That's a lovely question. Because a really good outcome for any conflict is that the parties can work together again or they can part yeah. with grace without harming each other. Yeah. And Sadly, the law doesn't actually give a toss mm -hmm. about whether that's possible or not. And the win-lose approach of litigation yes. means that the loser is likely not to enjoy an ongoing relationship with the winner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the opportunity to investigate all the relationships that are at stake, to think about all of them, mm -hmm. even the ones that are not the immediate parties, yeah means that you can actually be a very constructive influence yeah. in people's working and private lives. Do you think that's fair? I agree. I, there's this quote that comes to me. I don't remember which judge said it, but in mediation, 
particularly when judges order, unwilling participants often do end up becoming willing towards the end. Is that the quote, I think? Are you talking about Frank Sanders' quote yes. about yes. there's a difference between being compelled into mediation yes. and being compelled within mediation? He was defending mandatory mediation and its critics by mm. saying just because you're required to have a go doesn't mean that you forced to stay there. Mm, Precisely. Right. And I find that quite beautiful about a mediation that even though perhaps some mediations are court ordered, by the end of it, it's no longer co- coerced or court ordered. Mm. And I find that really um, a really interesting dynamic in it, a mediation. It is, and the resolution rates are just about the same. Mm. So that tells us something too. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. I guess doing criminal law now, it's an unfortunate circumstance of the law that there's always going to be a winner and a loser in court disputes. So I guess it's kind of reassuring to see that there's a focus beyond black letter law and kind of wanting to repair relationships in ADR, I guess. And the criminal law that you're studying has been wise enough, although it's a bit slow, but it's been wise enough to think about um, diversionary programs that are a kind of ADR. Mm. So you think of the um, youth justice environment, you think of restorative justice. Those movements are the expanded face of ADR, um, and let's hope that continues as well. Hopefully, yeah. And I understand there's a huge gap between the theory that we study now and what you practice in the field, but do you think that the skills competition, um, skills competition, sorry, offered here during our studies are kind of similar to what you encounter in a real world setting? I'll let you answer that one, Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> I am so proud of the skills competitions that Law Sock runs. I think the student leadership that we see is thrilling and I don't think they represent what happens in real life. They are better than what happens in real life. I think they show what could happen and sadly I think lots of practicing lawyers have hijacked the processes and they turn them, they've turned ADR into a fight in another forum. So instead of understanding that ADR offers the opportunity to explore interests, to brainstorm, to think about creative options, I think lawyers stifle a lot of those opportunities at birth when these fabulous, fabulous students who really get it know what to do with it and to bring value. So I I could not be prouder of people like Nikki. I just... It's been a privilege and a thrill to work with them because the, the students are raring to go with these ideas. You've mentioned how the skills competitions are great in building value and often in practice it's not exactly exemplified. Um, do you think that there are ways that it can be changed and applied to legal practice? Well... I see law students growing in confidence Mm. as they realise that they're in demand Mm. and they realise they can be influential in law firms. Mm. I I want law students to be saying to the firms they join, "No, no, I'm going to do it a different way. I want to build a practice where we truly bring in all these tools and we behave in a situation specific way. I, th- I think there's le- significant leadership available and I want them to grasp their confidence to show that leadership. Yeah, that's really interesting that you talk about sort of these skills competitions providing confidence because that's sort of been my experience with these competitions, instilling confidence in students throughout their degrees. Mm. Definitely. And I guess going beyond co-curricular experiences, um, as a law school educator, Do you think that the current law school curriculum as it stands is adequate in equipping students with the skills to pursue a career in law outside of the corporate and private sectors? Skills like um, empathy or able to form relationships uh, between parties rather than just disputing. Well, I think think law schools have a big challenge because um, there are a range of core 
legal requirements they have to comply with. Yeah. And, I, and I really understand the constraint of that. I think the other problem is by the time you've covered all those core subjects, there's not the opportunity for a lot of electives. Yeah. So I think if you added a whole lot of extra electives, you create a situation that's very hard for universities to manage. Yeah. So going back to what Nikki was saying, I think it makes the role of these competitions particularly important. Um, and I think the biggest hole, and, I'm, and I do not criticise the university for this, the biggest hole in my experience is we don't teach students to think about how they communicate. We teach students to think about what they're going to communicate, but the power of the communication and its persuasion lies in the communication vehicle. Yeah. And... We, we've certainly been putting some focus on it in the, the undergraduate ADR subject. Yes. But I don't think there is room in the curriculum to do much more. So the competitions couldn't be more important. Yeah, I agree. I think every um, course has its limits yeah. um, and priorities. And I'd say the ADR course has provided a platform for understanding communication vehicles. But I would also say that in combination with the skills competitions and the incredible judges who are willing to dedicate their time yeah. um, out of their professional lives to equip students with adequate communication strategy yeah. and tactics, which are different, <laughs> as we've learned, uh, I think that's what makes all the difference. Yeah, definitely. I understand that there's only so much that university courses can do and I guess the skills competitions are invaluable in allowing students to develop on those communication skills in a setting that stimulates the real world. And I guess for you, Rosemary, um, have you felt that paving the way as a female leader within your field has provided you with any unique challenges? I'm smiling because I just think it's lovely that you call me a female leader. I don't actually see myself like that. I think I've been extraordinarily lucky and serendipity has stepped in and taken me on this strange and circuitous path. So um, I, all of it's been challenging yeah. and I've spent two thirds of my life being absolutely terrified oh. that I'd taken on something that I was going to be hopeless at. Yeah. and. It, and I never thought that I'd finish my doctorate. I, you know, I had teenage children and my mother-in-law lived with me and I was working full time and it nearly killed me. I don't know how I did it. Um, and I was, I was terrified the whole time. But what did I learn? That you're always rewarded for keeping your nerve mm -hmm. and you, you just have to keep putting your hand up for stuff. So I'm grateful and thankful. <laughs> what was your doctorate in? It was a study of how lawyers negotiate. Wow. From the point of view of clients, because there's been a lot of research about how lawyers negotiate, mm. but it was by law. It was lawyers researching what other lawyers said <laughs> about it. And so I never thought it was very satisfactory research. So I did all these focus groups with commercial clients and private mm. clients and accountants and real estate agents and I it was very different it was a very different outcome oh good to hear um but you mentioned that your path and I understand that your path is unique and you've accomplished a lot so I guess what I'm wondering is what aspect of your role um throughout the years have you found most rewarding or challenging or maybe both well it's an important question and I have thought quite hard about it um, I think one of the greatest joys in life is when you discover what you were put on the planet to do. Yeah. Lots of people spend their whole life searching. And in my 50s, I figured it out. And I was put on the planet to make a difference in people's lives. That's what I'm here for. And 
every day I get up and I'm given the opportunity, if I want to do it, I'm given the opportunity to influence people's lives. And how precious is that? Yeah. What a privilege is that? How joyful is that? So it's really hard and it's really tiring and I get terrified I'm going to muck stuff up. <laughs> and of course I do. And Nikki will tell you my attention to detail is a shocker. It's just appalling. But, but, you know, the mediation work, watch, watching people respond to opportunities to do things differently and better and and have them stay in my life it's just i've been very fortunate definitely yeah wow and i'll pose the same question to you nikki as the vice president of um the skills portfolio and i guess what aspect of your role would you find rewarding or challenging yeah i might answer both of those the yeah. rewarding aspect or both. Or both, yeah. and the challenging aspect in turn i'd say the rewarding aspect is being able to make change yeah. uh and implement change that you wish you could have seen going throughout university Um, and what I mean by that is we were very fortunate to have the support of Rosemary and other mediation professionals to implement the first ever women's negotiation competition and I would say that that is probably the most rewarding thing I've done in my university career like my university experience Um, but I'd say definitely has its challenges Uh, Particularly, I would never consider myself um, a leader in any capacity. I think you're always learning and you're you're always growing. But in my position, I have learnt that often at times the way you wish to be perceived and the way you potentially are perceived can be two different things, um, particularly due to gendered undertones. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you wish to be perceived as assertive, yeah. Um, you often at times could be perceived as aggressive. Yeah. And if you wish to be perceived as firm, you often are perceived as bossy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's something I, I'm quite young. I'm still something I'm grappling with, but it's something I've noticed. Um, and I think that it'll take time to change that sort of narrative. And we need to start by making Nikki change her narrative because she shows remarkable leadership Mm -hmm. and she leads by example. She does the hard stuff herself to show everybody that it can be done. She's unfailingly polite and courteous and helpful and I wouldn't mess with her. She's very determined and she, she needs to acknowledge that that women's negotiation competition was her initiative. She put all this effort and energy into it, and I'm going to name it, (laughs) even if you won't. And it's something to be really proud of. Yeah. It's very kind of you. No, I'm not kind, darling. You know I'm not kind. Yeah. But I'm (laughs) proud. You see, all these wonderful students that we have and all their accomplishments. I hope when I'm in my bath chair and I'm having to be pushed along the foreshore, someone like you will be pushing me. <laughs> you know I will, I will. <laughs> of course. Um, definitely. <laughs> Aiden has no words. We, yeah. we made you lose your place, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we tend to do that. <laughs> and a question for you, Nikki. Um, for students at a university level, um, what competitions are offered by the UNSW Law Society to kind of give these people a taste of what it's like to work as a lawyer? Yeah, so I like to say that the skills portfolio provides some practical experience to university law students at UNSW. So we offer four university competitions. So that's witness examination, which is essentially the title, examining a witness and asking them questions under oath in a courtroom. Uh, We also offer negotiation and mediation competitions Negotiations are essentially a lawyer and a client from team A and a lawyer and a client from team B negotiating an outcome based on general and confidential facts. And the mediation competition is in the same vein. You have a lawyer and a client from both parties, uh, but you also have a mediator and that all really changes the dynamic of the competition. And that's actually a competition that UNSW well, not so recently anymore, but I think it was 2018, 2019, 
pro provided and our last competition is client interviewing. Yeah. Uh, client interviewing is uh, another element of the legal process where you interview your client regarding a dispute uh, and you try and ascertain more information regarding that particular dispute and whether you can assist them as their legal representative. So all these competitions cover different elements of legal practice yeah. and inform students on the careers and the skills necessary and available to them. And I, I like to say that these skills are really transferable to all careers and the communication that comes out of them. As a product of that, as someone who did compete in those competitions, I did find it very kind of rewarding to have something available to me outside of sitting in a classroom, doing readings, answering questions, mm -hmm. something that allowed me to actually feel like I was a practicing lawyer, even if it's for 20, 30 minutes. That's, yeah. That's and great. find your authentic voice. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. I think mm. those competitions are quite powerful. And I'm not just saying that because <laughs> I'm VP. I, yeah. I actually remember doing my first ever negotiation competition in first year and just thinking, this makes sense. Mm. This, mm. this just makes sense to do. And yeah, I just yeah. really loved it. So and yeah, I yeah. guess I continued on with it for the next five years of my degree. So. Yeah, it's I completely really understand, good. yeah. All right. Um, and for you, Rosemary, um, you've been the academic coach of the ICC Paris team for over 15 years. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or advice for any students who are kind of interested in this field and wish to get some experience? Or maybe could you expand a bit more and explain kind of what the team does? Well, the competition, the ICC International Commercial Mediation Competition, most prestigious competition of its kind um, in the world and um, I'm, I'm thrilled that I bullied the university into um, <laughs> participating in it and I bullied them into making it a six unit of credit subject oh. and I think that students who are interested in getting to that competition should start early with the beginners negotiation just keep going in all those negotiation competitions the open mediation competitions, the inter-varsity competition, yeah. you can't have too much experience. Yeah. I would agree. I'd say that for students who are really interested in competing in ICC Paris or even competitions like the Asia Pacific Mediation Competition, yeah. giving a go those competitions that are internal first is incredible. You build so much value because you you know, gain connections with judges mm -hmm. who probably have will judge those international competitions oh. and have a lot of experience in the field. So, yes, put your hand up for everything. Try everything. Be terrified. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, that's very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> the ICC yeah. competition is a bit scary at times, mm. but it's, it's terrifying. So worthwhile. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It's very worthwhile. And I guess um, I understand that you founded the company uh, Strategic Action. Um, could you expand on what the firm does and maybe how you got started? Okay. So uh, I, I was Secretary General of the Law Council of Australia and I met my current husband and decided to move to Sydney to have a life with him here. And... I had to find something to do and I I had a background in strategic planning as well as other things and so I joined Deloitte as it then was <clears throat> to set up lawyers management services which is a management consulting business for law firms and I was a very square peg in a round hole <laughs> I was a terrible fit and I thought this is awful so I thought I'll set up my own business and so I started off doing strategic planning yeah. just for law firms and then it spread to professional service firms and then Alan pushed me to go to Harvard and then all this transformation, the serendipity I was talking about. <laughs> and so gradually I added other things to my portfolio, mm -hmm. mediation and negotiation and I do quite a lot of conflict coaching now. So it just keeps developing. and. Yeah. My idea of staying relevant is you're always looking for the next opportunity. You always have to have some new skill on the drawing board. Yeah. You can never stop learning. And um, as, as one particular thing you offer becomes a commodity, yeah. 
where everyone's doing it, give it up, move on. Do the next thing where my goal is to be in a niche in the market where I have the fewest competitors. Oh, definitely, yeah. Hmm. And I guess kind of going off that, did you find it difficult leaving what some perceive would be the security of a big firm like Deloitte into making your own firm and providing your own services? Well, the partner I reported to as I left said, you're making a big mistake, Rosemary, and when you come back with egg all over your face to get your job back, it won't be here. Wow. And I thought, expletive deleted. (laughs) I'm never coming back. And a couple of years later, he he waddled down the hill to my office to see if I had a job for him. So I was... I thought, how delicious. <laughs> so, Lots of eggs. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't put on the planet to be an employee. And, right. and um, that's why I never wanted tenure at the university. That fills me with horror. So I, I, I like deciding who I'll work with. Mm. And I don't work for anyone I despise. It's established that there is a path that a lawyer should take graduate, get a clerkship, go into uni. And I guess for people who don't find that path rewarding or enriching, and I guess maybe I'm one of those people, I guess it's too early to tell, it's it's very reassuring to see that there is something else or somebody doing something else and succeeding. I guess that's really reassuring to see. Well, I actually think law is the new generic degree. Mm, I have heard that, yeah. I do think so. And I think it gives you, I think having that credential gives you a legitimacy that makes other jobs available to you. Because people think, you know, you're in the top percent of the whole country, mm. you've got a big brain, okay, you'll be able to do it. Yeah. So accept it as groundwork yeah. and choose for, the, choose for the right place to come to you, and it will. Definitely. Mm, it yeah. will. Well, thank you very much. That's very good advice. Um, and for you, Rosemary, uh, you've had over 30 years of experience as a lawyer, strategic planner, as you mentioned, educator and CEO. And I assume you must have had experience a lot over that time. But could you pinpoint kind of the most memorable moment of your career or what you look back and find the most rewarding? Gosh, that's hard. Mm. I think when I walked across the stage and got my doctorate, mm. I thought that was, that was a re- really remarkable moment because I never thought I could. Yeah. And then when I walked up on the stage last year and got my little award as Academic of the Year, first time a sessional teacher has ever been awarded that. Wow. And I, I didn't put my hand up for that award. A colleague of mine in Melbourne wow. put, put me forward. I, I would never have had the confidence to do it. And she, she, she said, you're not going to stop me, I'm doing it. And I just felt really loved and cared about and, and valued. Definitely. And I think that was a wonderful moment. It was a gift. Wow. You've done a lot for um, mediation and progressing it in Australia. So I think it was in due time for that award to be given. And yeah. But I've been fortunate, Nikki, and marvellous students like you who just fill me with admiration for how energetic you are and how enthusiastic you are and how you really get it. How not that wonderful? It is. It yeah. Is. There are a lot of students, um, particularly from Rosemary's ICC Paris teams, that just adore her and have really, really enjoyed studying that course and competing in that competition. So... I, I know I'm not alone in saying that. No, yeah. <laughs> but students who do enjoy mediation or ADI in university, how do you recommend they transition this to a full-time career or something they could pursue? It, it is extraordinarily hard to understand what that looks like. Mm-hmm. My suggestion is that one of the problems we have is that we feel we have to know the answer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the answer comes gradually. Yeah. And I think it's much better just to put one foot in front of the other and say, well, look, that's what really interests me, but I'm going to do the hard yards. I'm going to go to a law firm and get my basic credentials there. So I've got that on my CV. I'm going to tell everyone that I'm interested in 
some kind of career to do with ADR. Yeah. I'm going to look for opportunities. I'm going to volunteer. Yeah. I'm going to talk to people who are doing it already and find my find my slot. And and so it's it's a it, it's a searching journey, yeah. and it never turns out how you think. Mm. And you know the the scary don't you think the scariest person on the planet is a ten year old who says they want to be a brain surgeon, and you meet them thirty years later and they are a brain surgeon, and you think life's passed you by, mate. Really, mm. yeah. there are all sorts of other things that you might have experienced and had pleasure from. Yeah. So. I don't think be, I don't think it's a time to be linear and logical. It's a time to be circuitous and try a whole lot of stuff and have yeah. fun and play and have a life. And then the answer will come to you. It just I'm living proof of it. I, that actually, I'm, I'm like trying to decipher that. It's actually very that's very good. Well, advice. it's a, it's a message yeah. for you because I I can see that you're struggling with the challenge of. Mm. I know law's a good degree. Yeah. I know because I was intelligent and worked hard and got into it, I have to finish it. Yeah. It's not the love of my life. Yeah. Where's it going to take me? What am I going to do to be fulfilled? Yeah. I'm choosing to give you encouragement that you've been wise and you're on a path and just accept it's coming. Oh, definitely. And I think that speaks to a lot of law students. Mm. Yes, it yeah. does. Because it's a pretty oversaturated degree. Yeah. but. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, it, it, give, it gives you the basics and it demonstrates that you, have, that you are consistent, that you are persistent, yes. and that you can finish what you start. Mm. And that, funnily enough, for an employer, that makes you attractive. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. And, and then you have to find your own way of breaking out because law is a constraining profession mm. for many people. Yeah. And... Many of you students see the world differently and are very right-brained and, and want to have creative adventures. Yeah. And, I guess, and have it. Yeah. No, because I feel like there's a lot of pressure on students to have it figured out now. And I guess there's a lot of noise saying, do a clerkship, go do this, go do that. So it's really reassuring to see that you should take your time, figure it out, figure out what you want to do and try new things. And I guess... It's a very important lesson that mm. people should learn. No one ever suffered from doing what made them happy. Oh. I'd say. Wow. So if that's something that's important, and that's, that's what I'd say, if it's something that's important to you. Mm. Then, Definitely, yeah. yeah. It's true. Mm. Absolutely right. Mm. And in my capacity as a parent and grandparent, <laughs> yeah. my gift to my children was not to say to them, you better knuckle down and decide what you want to be. Mm. Because neither not the three of them have chosen really extraordinary paths that have taken them to places that they never thought they would go to, and I yeah. never thought they would either. <laughs> and they've had all kinds of interesting learning along the way, and I've never been disappointed. Wow, that's that's really great to see. And I guess, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is um, in a professional and on an undergraduate level? Um, for the future of mediation? And where do you see kind of the entire field going 10 or 20 years in the future? I think there are two challenges actually. I think one is that lawyers have hijacked a lot of the benefits. Yeah. Mm. I'm really sad about that. Um, and I'm, I'm choosing to believe that people like Nikki can make a difference and, and start to show that show law firms that they really have to broaden their repertoire. It's the first challenge. The second challenge is, for all our talk, mediation is not yet a profession. Yeah. It does not have a peak body. It doesn't have a set of processes and protocols that all other professions have. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it remains extraordinarily difficult to make a career out of being a mediator. Yeah. There are only a handful of people who are busy full-time as mediators. Yeah. So m mediation has to make up its mind if it's going to stay an emerging profession yeah. or if it's going to get serious about 
what it what it is and what it does and what it looks like and how it how it it controls itself. Mm. My daughter and her business partner are currently doing a review of the National Mediator Accreditation Standards, yep. and she's actually putting just those challenging questions mm. to the Mediator Standards Board, and it'll be interesting to see if they take up the challenge. Definitely. You must be very proud. She's continuing your I'm legacy. astounded. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she trained as a musician, <laughs> and she's ended up as a mediator. That's what, that's what I was talking about, Aidan. Mm. Who would have thought that journey? No, definitely. It's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess one final question for both of you before we leave. And you've said a lot of great things in this episode, but what is the best piece of advice you would give to a student cur- currently studying law? Uh, the best advice I can give is you have enormous potential, keep going. That's what I would say, I think. Yeah, I think just following the tone of today. This is the advice I wish I could have given myself is don't let fear and uncertainty stop you from trying new things and taking risks. Wow. I'd say. Mm. Thank you to both Nikki and Rosemary for their time. Um, You said some really great things and I'm sure anyone who listens to this podcast will gain something. Thank you for listening to Insights by the UNSW Law Society. Um, If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any future episodes.